Welcome to this week's Degrees of Science. I uh, got a cool topic with you. I got in, joined by Johnny Barton and Dave Eisfeld, who uh, got a cool group that y'all have. Tell us about your uh, society y'all have. Well, I, I appreciate you welcoming us to your uh, program. Yeah. Uh, the Central Texas Astronomical Society is the local astronomy club, and we're members of There's about 150 astronomy enthusiasts of various degrees. We have actually operate a research grade observatory with a 24 inch telescope out between Clifton and Gatesville. And uh, like I say, we're, we have uh, people that are involved in different degrees, uh, people that just like to come out and sit out a lawn chair and look up at the dark sky, people that have their own uh, telescopes that like to come out and do their own program observing. We have people involved in astrophotography and we have people that just like to do the public outreach that we do uh, once a month. We have a uh, public, uh, observatory uh, open to the public uh, open house the third Saturday of every month. We also have a star party that we conduct at uh, the Hubbard City Lakes once a month. And so we just invite everybody to go to our website. It's uh, syntexastronomy.org. We are a 501c3 organization. And just go to the calendar and just look on there. We like people to just register if they're coming out for the open house. This way we know how many people are coming. It's free, there's no charge. It's just a really good, fun event for the whole family. All right, so, uh, so Dave, what, what got, I, I love to see what kind of gets y'all interested. What, what got you interested in being part of the society? Uh, well, I actually saw a TV show that uh, had, uh, where they showed the different constellations in the sky, and it was really interesting, and I turned around and bought me a little eight inch Dobb telescope, and, from then on. <laughs> it's a lifelong passion, it yeah, sounds like. It is. Yeah, and, I, and, and Central Texas is a pretty good area to, to do astronomy. I know you're, we've talked to experts to talk about, you know, the, the cities are starting to take away some of that dark sky, but there's yeah. plenty of areas you can really get a good yeah. view, right? Light pollution is a bad thing for <laughs> astronomy. But we do actually have a pretty dark sky out at the uh, observatory site out between Clifton and Gatesville. So we're out actually up on about a, a thousand foot bluff there. And uh, I may add that the observatory it was done by uh, a donation by the Meyer uh, Foundation. Uh, Paul Meyer, Paul and Jane Meyer donated the funds for our observatory. Charles and Dor Dorothy Turner actually donated the property. We're sitting on a five acre track out there. And so uh, we're very grateful to those people. And uh, so we have a really nice site out there for so everybody to come to. Somebody that wanted to go out there and when y'all do your open house, what, what can y'all see that people wouldn't expect from that observatory out there? Well, the, the, the main thing, most people are amazed is you come out and you can actually see the Milky Way. It looks like a cloud. People you know, get upset. They say, well, we got clouds coming in. No, that's not an actual cloud. That's the Milky Way. And so you, know, you can see a lot of things that you can't normally see mm -hmm. in the city. So, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, professional astronomers, but your kind of your hobby astronomers, y'all do a lot to help out when it comes to research, right? Yeah, and getting into the research, and you know, we're associated with another group that we do our research with. Actually, we do a lot of research with, our observatory, you know, with the observatory with our local group. But Dave and I are associated with another group of amateur astronomers called the International Occultation Timing Association, and that's a mouthful to say. <laughs> yeah. And I refer to them as the IOTA. And they're a group of uh, amateur astronomers that got formed about 1975, and they realized the value in to doing occultation timings on different celestial objects that we have, like the planets, and mainly the asteroids. And so it's evolved from a um, a, a local or I say a, a national group to an international group. They have groups in Europe, Asia, down in South America, and Australia, but the main group here in the United States. And we have about 120 members here in the United States that do these occultation timing. So, so what all goes into timing an asteroid? And uh, that's the main thing there, mm -hmm. doing the timing. And uh, when an asteroid passes in front of a star, it is, it's called an occultation. It blocks the light of the star. And in the animation, it shows a blue line that uh, dips down as the asteroid passes in front of the star. It's called a, t a, a light curve. Mm. And the light curve then uh, dips down, and then and when the star comes back out from behind the asteroid, then the light curve comes back up. And that little dip is what we time, and that actually gives us a very accurate measurement of the asteroid. You know, 
a lot of people ask me, you know, what we do, and a lot of people that I show my observatory to, they say, well, what do you do here? I say, well, I measure and determine the shape and size of asteroids. And then they give you a little funny look, so how do you do that? And so that is how we do it. And it's actually a uh, formula that you learn is in elementary school about speed and time and distance. You know, like when, you know, you're going to go visit grandma's house and you're going to be traveling uh, 60 miles an hour and it's going to take you two hours to get to grandma's house. Well, how far does grandma live? Well, that'd be 120 miles. Well, the same thing occurs here. We know how fast these asteroids are traveling. And a lot of them are traveling rather fast. Oh, some of them over 100,000 miles an hour. And so we, we time that and we've got the timing. And so then we'll get the distance that it took it to travel that distance uh, that the, the star blinks out. Now we've had a, a image of a actual uh, path that is created. And what I tell everybody is that these events actually are a mini eclipse. Mm. And we're, we're all looking forward to the solar eclipse in April of next year when the moon passes in front of the sun. Well, these events that we observe are just like little mini eclipses. We've got the sun or the star that's out there several light years away. And we've got these asteroids that are anywhere from several million to almost a billion miles away from us. And they're really, t some of them are really tiny. And uh, as we do these events, like the video showed the actual uh, asteroid, it doesn't look like that when we do our we, uh, events. We can't see any detail on the asteroid itself. In fact, a lot of times we can't see the asteroid at all. Mm. It's really too small and too dim, too far away. So, Dave, are y'all using just regular telescopes to look, or are y'all using a special kind to see these dips in the light? Yeah, uh, Johnny uses a 12 and a half inch Newtonian. I mm. use 11 inch Lestron SCT, which okay. is a uh, long focal length and scope. But you essentially need, you know, I would say at least an eight inch if you, you're uh, if you want to see more of these, because the, the, the dimmer the star is, the, the bigger the aperture of the scope. And they have a kit on the IOTA that's for sale for the, you know, just any, anyone that's out there that wants to do this amateur occultation. Uh, it, it, it consists of a camera that you're going to plug in the back of the scope. It, it's, it's, it's a regular, like a uh, security camera. It's the old style video you know, back when TV stations, mm. you know, before 2009 when they switched over. And uh, you have that and you're going to feed that video into this VTI unit, which is a timer. And it st time stamps each of those fields of that video. And then it, then you feed it to a, uh, a little uh, USB device that converts it from digital, I mean from analog to digital, uh, you know, to, to, to go into your laptop and there's a program that uh, captures it. Oh, okay. So it, it so you can look back at you that can time look feed back. And know where the shadows you can, are. You can actually look at the video yeah. and you can watch the dip in the curve if, if there's one, because mm -hmm. sometimes there's a miss. And misses are important too, because they know where it's not at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why, why is this important for people to be watching these asteroids and timing them and trying to learn the, the distances and stuff like that? Well, the main thing is that uh, there's a lot of asteroids out there. Mm -hmm. And the ones that we actually are really afraid of are the ones that are coming in close to Earth. They call a very uh, a close approach to Earth. You, you hear about them on the news all the time. We just got passed by a near Earth asteroid or something like that. Or one actually falls about the size of a car or so and causes a, a big streak across, or like the one in Russia that actually caused a lot of damage. And so we really uh, want to keep up with all of the near Earth asteroids because the one that the uh, actually extinct the dinosaurs was only six miles in diameter. And uh, there's about 30,000 asteroids that are considered to be near Earth asteroids. About 10,000 of them are between about a half a mile wide and a little larger. And so we want to keep up with those really close. But those are not the ones we normally uh, observe. Dave and I, may, our, most of our observations are in the main asteroid belt, which lies between Mars and Jupiter, which are several million of them out there. And then there's another group that's called the Trojan asteroids, and they lie in the same orbit with Jupiter. And they, uh, there's, a there's a leading edge group and there's a trailing edge, edge group. And there, there's a NASA project called the Lucy Project. And it's uh, on its way now. It's, been, it's launched a couple of years ago. It's the longest uh, lasting mission that NASA's ever launched. 
Well, one of the first asteroids that it needs to observe, which will be in the year 2027, is called Palomili. Well, Palomili had a occultation event last year, and the Southwest Region Institute organized a occultation, they call it expedition, where they wanted to put as many pe as people they could across the path of the asteroid. And so they, they arranged about 26 people, and some of these were our IOTA people, so some of professionals and amateurs were part of this group. Well, two of our group, the amateurs, actually discovered that that asteroid had a moon. And that threw the uh, Southwest Region people into a frenzy because they have to orchestrate the probe as it gets closer to where they want it to be in 2027. So they need to find out more about the uh, orbit of that particular moon. You're catching it going in front of another star, not not our sun as much as the that's, other stars. That's no, these that's are stars that are light years okay. away. Uh, yeah. It's it's pretty exciting to watch if if you've never done one because I remember the first time I did one, uh, I was watching it and and they used to do it by calling out the time and using WWV receiver with the time hat and you would record your voice, you know, D and R for disappear, return. And I, I was sitting there watching it and I was gonna do that even though I'm recording it. And when it happened, I was so excited I didn't even call out anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually what happens. But it's, it's interesting because you get that shot mm. and you miss it, you know, you miss it if you're doing it. And you, you really know, only got voice. one shot, right? Right. Right. right? but if you're doing it with video, you can actually, you know, you can actually replay it, but it's 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 really neat to watch it, especially if you're outside the shadow area and you don't expect it. You expect a miss, and there's a hit. You know, it disappears, and reappears. It means it's shifted, which it happens a lot. Right. Uh, but it's it's exciting to watch. That. It's been described by many that, that do these. It's the most amazing sight that you'll ever see through the eyepiece of a telescope, and that's usually what gets people hooked on it. I did my very first one back in 1983, and I've been hooked on it ever since. And I say it's very habit forming. Yeah, because like you're talking, you're talking about an asteroid, which I mean, they're big, but in the whole, you know, space, it's a, you know, like a piece of sand flying. Mm -hmm. So the odds of seeing that go in front of a star that's light years away, that's that's a, such a cool thing to be able to see. And to, to be able to predict that, I mean, back when we were starting to do, the, back when I started to do this uh, back in 83, or and then, then on past, uh, you were lucky to see one or two a year. Uh, now, uh, they've got the prediction, in fact, here just recent years, the prediction rate has, I guess, doubled or tripled or tripled, quadrupled, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, all because of another uh, advent of uh, astronomy that amateurs are actually contributing to, and that's the GIEA star catalog. The European Space Agency is conducting, or is compiling the most massive star catalog ever compiled. And you have to know precisely where the star lies out there in the sky to be able to predict when this asteroid is going to pass in front of it. I can tell you all have a passion for it, but somebody for the astronomical side are, are interested in it. How, how would they get in touch with you all to learn more to try to get involved? Well, if they wanted to uh, get involved, um, they go to our website, the central syntexastronomy.org, and go to the contacts, which is at the top of the, of the page. And uh, on the context, I'm at the very bottom of the list. I'm the Astronomical League representative on, on our club, and Dave's are actually our treasurer. He's on there too, but mine's the only phone number that's on there oh, at okay. the bottom. And so if they would want to call me and they want to get involved, I can actually talk with them and uh, tell them exactly what equipment is necessary and the process to go through to get involved. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really a very exciting uh, thing to do. It's it's one of those things that you will witness something that very few people get to witness. And, and at the same time, have fun at it, but also have uh, make a contribution to real science. And so, so uh, it, it's, it's, it's really a, it's an interesting th uh, hobby to be in. It's awesome to think, you know, the local and you know, like I said, the more your, your hobby astronomers can help out something that's such a big global thing. Like there is just so much stuff going on in the universe that uh, there's too much going on for the professional people to to watch and to keep up with. I mean, there's uh, there are comets being discovered. 30, 40 years ago, over half the comets were discovered by amateurs. Nowadays, they're all discovered by sky survey 
teams. And there are the movies that came out in the night, late 90s, like uh, Armageddon and uh, Deep Impact, brought a very uh, big attention to the fact that we may get impacted by either, those were comets. And so uh, they, the people inquired with their representatives in Congress then got involved and started funding a lot of these sky survey teams. There's probably about a dozen sky survey teams now out, uh, and they find about two to 300 asteroids a year. And so, uh, you know, we are constantly getting new, new asteroids all the time. Uh, and it, it, the, the list keeps getting bigger and bigger all the time. It's, uh, it, it's interesting. I, I love talking to folks like y'all and kind of learn a little bit about stuff like this, but thank y'all for taking some time to talk mm -hmm, about sure. it. And again, we'll pass along y'all's website and how to get a hold of y'all so folks can find out. Very well. Thank you very much. Thank you.